Welcome to another edition of Barry Switzer's Legacy Oklahoma Football. Today's guest, Mr. Keith Jackson, All-American tight end from Little Rock, Arkansas, who started and made All-State at safety yeah. in high school. How did you do You got to go through the recruiting process and tell me how you didn't end up on defense at the University of Oklahoma. Well, I thought I was going to be a defensive player. I actually had about 10 interceptions my senior year. Actually, there was a coach that said, our best player and one of our fastest is Keith Jackson. The problem was I weighed 240 pounds. And so, and I'm back there, safety. I'm bigger than a linebacker and some of the linemen playing safety. And returning but, punts. Too. And returning punts. But you know, when you got a guy that big back there, coach, players are intimidated. They drop a lot of passes when they there's a 240 pound guy back there. But I really like playing safety. When I got recruited, I thought somebody would recruit me at safety. Tight end, tight end, tight end. Nobody came in and say, oh, you look like an NFL safety down the line. <laughs> they probably thought I was too big to go away oh, from being off. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, they sure did. What are, you, uh, I was gonna, what are your first memories of seeing him on I film? wanted to see him play basketball. I didn't really pay, pay. We all knew he was the most highly recruited tight end in the country. Florida, everybody was in here. And, and the Little Rock trying to recruit Keith Jackson. I I looked at film of him and uh, knew he didn't have to look at much. You knew he's a great, talented player. I wanted to see him play basketball in Little Rock. He played Parkview High School. I wanted to see him play basketball. And you know what? I said, my God, he ought to be playing the NBA. And I said that to him. He said, Coach. I would have, if I'd been three inches taller, I'd been the next Charles Barkley because that was my first love was basketball. And I said, well, thank goodness you were three inches taller. You're tall enough to play tight end for us. But we, we recruited him and recruited him hard. But let me tell you, when you recruit a great player out of the state of Arkansas, I mean, you have accomplished something because it is hard to do. It is hard to overcome. The, 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 they are the most... Uh, they're tough. There's they're, they're only they, one team in town. There's only and, one track. And one that's the Razorbacks. State. And everybody's yeah. loyal yeah. to that, and everybody recruits for that yeah. uh, school. I coached there. I played there. I know. And uh, for us to get Keith out of there was a, a compliment to his mother, Gladys, and to Keith being strong enough to overcome the pressure that existed within the community in the state to say, no, I'm going to Oklahoma. Mark, that's I was tough. so excited about this legendary coach, you know, from Oklahoma was gonna come to my house and he was gonna lay it on my mother why I need to go and play for the Oklahoma Sooners. And he walks through the door and gets comfortable and he sits down and I go, here it goes. I'm excited, I, I'm going, we, he's gonna tell her why I need to go to OU. And he looks over and he said, Gladys, where are you from? And she said, I'm from Cheryl, Arkansas. He said, well, I'm from Crossville, Arkansas, Ashley County. Now, you like hot water cornbread or crackling cornbread? <laughs> Is that a true story, Coach? <laughs> what, now, what did you talk about the whole time you were in the house? About cooking and eating, and she got an Alzheimer. She yeah, got an Alzheimer yeah. in there. Yeah. She spent a lot of time in Alzheimer. We start uh, talking about our, our being raised the same time, same age, and all, and uh, and we were able to communicate. We I didn't need to talk about football. She didn't care about football. She all she cared about is that son going to be taken care of and uh, treated right. And right. uh, that's all she really cared about. So we talked about a lot of different things, home life, and uh, and uh, we got around about her life, and uh, we spent most of the time there and talked about soul food and recipes and things yep. like that. Yep. And no football then, yet. Uh, <laughs> then uh, I sat down in the middle floor, my foot started itching. I took off my loafers and I pulled down my sock, started scratching my foot. He did. And, and, <laughs> Because uh, his mother said that to she, what was it she said? She after said, the, that's the first white man ever took his shoes off in my house. <laughs> <laughs> so I was sitting there on the floor, we were watching TV. But what I told her when I got up and left, I turned back and I looked at Gladys and said, Gladys, you let Keith come to Arkansas, I mean, the University of Oklahoma, uh, and play for me. He says, I promise you, I'll treat him like he's one of my own. I'll take care of him. Now, you got to know my him. mother. You got to know my mother. She would only let us stay up late at night when the Razorbacks were playing late at night. So whether it was Sidney Moncrief in basketball or the football the team, she said, okay, you can stay up because she had to be in bed at a certain time. She was educationally driven and all that. And, and she was a Razorback through and through. That was right. it. She wanted Arkansas, but she stood her ground and she said, if you don't go to Arkansas, you'll be crazy not to go play for him. And I said, okay, that's what I wanted to hear. I heard nothing about he's gonna start, Nothing about he'll touch the football, which I didn't when I was here. I never got it. <laughs> I heard none of that. I heard crackling cornbread, greens, beans. I mean, I mean, it went down the line. I know I was hungry when you left. <laughs> hey, and you've done something, something about it ever since. Oh, forget that. <laughs> uh, did it come down to Oklahoma, Arkansas? 
for those no. two? No, no. It was, you know, uh, Spencer Tillman uh, showed me around that mm -hmm. when I came over here. And uh, my whole thing when I came on a recruiting visit, which Barry Switzer always had the edge, is I asked every player, what do you think about your coach? And I went to, you know, I went to different schools. I won't say any name to protect some of the head coaches. A, a lot of places, players did not like their head coaches. Later, Swisher says in life, he said, coaches don't recruit players, players recruit players. And actually, the players at Oklahoma love the organization that much. They love Coach Swisher that much. I called my mother at home and I said, I think they got a coat going over here. It's a Swisher coat going over here. They all love Swisher. Everybody loves Swisher and everything. And, and that sold me. Because when those players will, will, will tell you how much they care about their head coach and talk about how they love playing at the university, that's what recruits you. You know, you can't be you can be you can be recruited by tradition, but most of the time, the selling thing is the fact of do they like those head coaches, and that was important for me in the educational aspect too. In, the, in recruiting, Keith has touched on it here. Is there's a 48-hour visit? You have kids on your campus. You can spend thousands and thousands of dollars in recruiting, traveling all over the United States. Your assistant coaches to find guys like this, but what happens is it comes down to that 48 hours of their own campus because. It comes down to what your players, your family thinks about you. And if their family likes you and knows that you'll care about them and you'll take care of them when they need help, then, hey, they're going to recruit for you. And that's what he's pointing out. And we always did that. I've always done that. And I always have, like I was told, class wasn't the first mom said, you let him come, I'm going to take care of him. When he needs help, I'm going to take care of him. Well, I'm going to tell you, let's and fast I mean, forward. I'm going to tell you. Right. I didn't get taken as good, Kathy. Greg and Doug, they got it way better than I did. I'm going to tell you that right now. His kids got it better. But, but recently we had a chance to travel to Italy together. We went, oh, we yeah. went on a trip together, and, uh, and uh, we had a sprinter. Coach got us. The guy showed up at the gate and took us right to the sprinter, and we're going around because I wanted to go to Italy and everything and, and all that stuff. And, uh, and, you know, I wanted to pay my part because, you know, I didn't want to be against, against the NCAA rules. But then I realized – that I'm grown, it's not against NCAA rules. So I said, hey, that bill is yours, Coach. <laughs> we, went, uh, we spent three days in Rome, three yep. days in Florence, three days in Venice, and we went to Como, then back to Genoa, then to Monte Carlo, to Nice, bullet train to Zurich, Switzerland, and flew back two weeks later. We had a blast. But that had to be That's more like trip. going to food camp. <laughs> yeah, you go right. with him on a trip like that, all you did is eat, eat and drink. Eat, eat, <laughs> drink eat. good wine and eat great food. All right, well, let's talk about when you arrived at Oklahoma. Uh, when did you know what kind of weapon you had? Because nobody could stop this guy. Well, first of all, you got to remember in 81, 82, and 83, they were the down years. We right. talked at Oklahoma in the early 80s. We were, well, there were a lot of reasons. We'd gotten away. Marcus Dupree was here one year. We'd gotten away from him, changed our offense basically with him, went to the I offense. He leaves me, and he run. And, and besides getting him, it's a great back, but he ran off a bunch of backs. Mm -hmm. Then him leave too. Then with the cupboard was very, except for uh, Spencer Tillman and Earl Johnson. They stuck it out. They were good kids. They stuck it out. They were my two backs, and they were good backs. So we went through. We ended up second in the Big Eight Conference, won eight games, but we lost to Nebraska and Texas, and for about three years in a row there. And I remember uh, Bonoski was the president. He calls me in his house. I want you to have a fireside chat with your regents here and. Uh, and uh, I went in and sat down. Uh, four of them had already called me and said, you don't need to talk to us as long as you got four of the seven regions. You ain't going to worry about nothing, Coach. So it's a poll of seven. You got four of them. I ain't worried about it. And I, I wasn't worried about it. So I went in and sat down with one regent. The last one was a great guy. I really love him, Dan, Dan Little. And we're sitting there, and Dan Little and Bonoski's home in front of his fireside chat there in front of the uh, fireplace. And I look at Dan, and he looks at me, and he says, I don't know why I'm here. <laughs> I said, Dan, it's because we haven't beaten Texas and Nebraska in the last three years. And he says, well, you know, I'm more into academics than I am athletics. And they says, you know what? My advice to you is you ought to win one of them this year. <laughs> <laughs> I swear, I swear. I started word. laughing. I said, we'll, we'll, we'll try to, Dan. We beat their ass for the next four years, both of them. We sure did. Four sure years did. in a row because of can people you, like this and the recruiting we did. And yes, uh, on yeah, my okay, show, okay. you can. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens is that, uh, is that we had recruited well. We made a commitment. Marcus left. We were going to go back to the wishbone. I'm looking for wishbone quarterbacks. We had had Aikman here. We'd make, we were making a transition kind of with Marcus and Aikman and all those things, needed a great tight end. And, and we, we had those instruments. But what happened? That's, no one's shooting at us. But there's no active shooter, I promise you. That's, balloons that's someone that's balloons to pop into the pool. Hey, let me tell you, they know it's no active shooter because an African-American would have been on the table by now. <laughs> hey, but the 
balloons are popping in the pool out there. But uh, where were we? Anyway, we were. We're talking about all the recruiting that you were doing, going back to the wishbone. Oh, yeah. We, so, so in 1984, we knew we were going to be good. I mean, we really did. Had him, had Ricky Dixon, Lydell had Lydell Carr. Mm-hmm. We, we had recruited well. We had all these quarterbacks. We had uh, uh, Eric Mitchell, Mark from Arkansas, a top quarterback in Arkansas. I got Charles Thompson. A lot coming. of red shirt freshmen. Uh, just a lot of good, good players. Jamail, and, we, and they still had Aikman. And uh, so we were a, really a talented football team. And going back to what we believed in, know what we knew best. So we ended up having a great defense because I had redshirted Bosworth, Dante Jones, Daryl Reed, and yep. Troy Johnson, four linebackers. They're really good players, stand-up players. And now they were redshirt freshmen starting. And with Tony Casillas in the middle, who was second player picked in the draft. And, uh, then the guys that tackled that could really, really run. And secondary was in great shape. So we, were, we led the nation three consecutive years, 74, 75, and 76 defense, total defense. Can I sing a, team can team. I sing a Toby's Keep song? We can talk about them usually, but right now I want to talk about me. Oh, you want to talk about me? <laughs> you don't want to hear about them other well, I want to talk I'm about me. To no, I don't. No, I'm, I'm getting to hear Eric, big boy. Because I'll just mess with I got, you. Through the, got through that three years before. Now we got into a great group of players that can really make something happen, and Keith was one of the leaders. Well, of he them. calls me into his office. You know, I'm, a, I'm a freshman. Freshman, the coach's office, the head coach's office, like the principal office in school. You do not want to go there. They said, Coach Swisher want to see you in his office. It's before the first game. We're going to play Stanford. And I walk in his office, and I sit down. And Switzer had this way of messing with you when, you, you know, you were a kid. He had a little button on his desk. Tell him what you do with that little button. I push that button, the door closes behind them after they walk in. It makes a loud noise. Bang, bang. <laughs> and you go, I'm in trouble, right? I'm most, like. <laughs> most of the time, you don't ever push the button. But because I have kids come in and leave all the time. They want to come in and see me. My door was always open to them. When Keith walks in, I called him in, but this is the first time he had ever heard the door <laughs> slam behind him. He's a like, like, <laughs> he said, uh, and he says to me, he goes, hey, um, have you seen the, 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 the Sooner Illustrated magazine or whatever it was, it was the game day? And I go, no, sir. He goes, well, look at it. So I'm thumbing through this thing. I'm so nervous, I don't even look at it. I'm just thumbing through it because he told me to look at it. I said, okay. He said, do you see what's on there? I go, yes, sir. He goes, no, you don't. It says right there, there's your name. I go, oh, I'm starting. <laughs> you know, that was a big deal. That was a big deal. Yeah, that was a, that was a big deal as a freshman at OU. I mean, you started at OU as a freshman, you could play, and, and none of us really realized that we were going to be able to do that. But seeing that name on there, it was exciting. I knew it. And now I go, I get to play. What am I going to do, you know? Yep. You and Lydell Carr, two freshmen started. Yeah, that, you could tell what was building there. Um, let's go to the 85 season, which was a weird year. It started really late. I don't think you guys, that was the opener against Minnesota well, that was late well, in September. We, we were a wishbone team with really not a true wishbone quarterback. Aikman was surrounded with enough good talent he could win in the wishbone. But he's not a wishbone quarterback. He can't run with the ball like the, my, my wishbone quarterbacks. He wasn't recruited as a wishbone quarterback, really. But what happens is that uh, uh, he did a good job in 85. He, he, we go beat Texas. We come back here and we play Miami. He gets his ankle broken. We insert Jamel Holloway, and all of a sudden we went from a 200-yard team rushing and just struggled against Minnesota, struggled against Texas, but won because our defense was so good. And then now we get him hurt in the third game against Miami. He breaks his leg. He's out for the year, and we have to insert a pure wishbone quarterback. And Jamel Holloway, I knew was going to be great. Then all of a sudden, boom, we went from 200 yards a game to 400 yards a game in rushing and controlling the ball, dominating the ball, uh, line of scrimmage and with the running game. So it was, uh, we were on our way then. But we would have won, I say this, we would have won the national championship if Aikman, even, 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 even if Aikman even. hadn't How, how did that, that had to affect you because that chemistry was there. You it was tell. there, yeah. So, so basically I went from catching four cast, passes a game to, catching and pass every century. But it was really great for the team, but it was horrible for a tight end who loved having a 6'4", 220-pound quarterback that could just wing it across the field. But we were a better offense and a more productive offense uh, in the wishbone. But it's also with the plan in the wishbone. A lot of people talk about all the passes that you catch as a tight end or receiver. The one thing about the wishbone that you'll learn is the free safety has to make a lot of tackles. 
he's got to be somewhere around 20 tackles or he, they're going to lose the game because he's got to get in those alleys. He's got to do all that. So the only person you really have to beat is one guy who's guarding you. So you have one-on-one with a, with a strong safety. If you can beat that strong safety and get open, you can make big plays. And so Jim Dunnan, who was our offense coordinator at the time, would say, okay, we're going to run 86 wide corner. And I run the corner. And, okay, 86 wide square. And he said, Jim Dunnan said, I got pretty smart. He said, we're going to call this 86 wide choice. Basically, Keith, you do what you want to, and Jamel will find you. And so that was great because I got a chance to catch a lot of passes. And, and then, you know, the thing about it is Spencer Tillman said one time, I asked him, I said, Spencer, why did you dive from the five-yard line over the head of the receiver into the end zone when you could have stopped and went around and scored? He said, Bubba, nobody would have remembered that. <laughs> so I remember him saying, "You big-time players make big-time plays in big-time situations. And I was always put in a position where I had to make plays. And I love those moments. I love those moments. I love them, but I did have to go to Coach Switzer and have a conversation about, Coach, I'm doing pretty good. You think I need to touch the ball a little more? Well, is that the what, genesis this, of the reverse? This is the yeah. genesis of the reverse. He comes in, we're getting ready to play Nebraska. And it was a week in the Nebraska game. And when we, Keith came in early in the week, yep. come in on Monday, I think, and Keith talked to me and says, Coach, I'd love to get the ball in my hands more. I said, I can make play, things happen. I'm, I'm a big time player with the ball in my hands. I said, I know that, Keith. I says, but uh, I, I don't want to line you up, line you up at fullback and halfback. I said, you don't fit there, but let me tell you, let's do something. I walked back with Keith, went back to the offensive staff room, and walked in the offensive staff room with Jim Donnan and Merv and those guys. I said, guys, I don't care how we do it. You figure out some way to get the ball in this guy's hand two or three times a ball game for sure. And Jim Donnan said, we'll go to work on it. That's when we put in the tight end reverse, started working on tight end reverse. Tight end reverse with the pass game off of it, tight end reverse with the option off of it. And uh, so we and, and, oh, and fake the tight end reverse and, and quarterback will keep the ball. And uh, after we establish the tight end reverse, and so what happens is that uh, we're in the Nebraska game, second series, and uh, yeah. we'll in second it. series of the Nebraska game, we were stopped the first series with punting, get the ball back, and uh, and they we, they were stopped. We get the ball back, and this is '85, and. Uh, I'm standing on the sidelines, and Jim Don says, let's run tight end. Uh, I'm going to hook up with the offensive coordinator, and, I, and he says, I'm going to call tight end reverse. I said, call it. Hell, we worked on it. We executed it all week. Run it. And, uh, and uh, he calls a play, and I'm sure it shocked him in the damn hole. It did. <laughs> and the reason why, Coach, was because typically when you start to work on a trick play, you work on it for weeks. And then you run it when you, you have an opportunity to run it. We started working on a Tuesday or th Wednesday, and and then we it's the second drive. We're on the twelve yard line, and and the, and they come off the sideline and they say uh, left formation tight end reverse right, and I go what? <laughs> well, that's uh, the, the, when they we called it. I've got my hunting and fishing coach Bobby Bell on the sidelines with me, and, and uh, we're standing there and and we called the play and. Keith goes out there, and we break the huddle, and they come up the line of scrimmage. And I looked at Bobby, says, touchdown. Snap the ball. Keith runs 80 yards for a touchdown. And Bobby, everybody screaming, oh, I said, Bobby, I said, how'd you know? How'd you know? I said, hell, I'm the head coach. <laughs> <laughs> and we made some good use out of that play uh, over yeah, the year. Then, I got a chance to run it a lot. That year, that year, we ran, you're a sophomore then, we ran, they started that series of the tight end reverse with the pass and all. We called it three or four times against OSU at home, the last game of the season. Yep. We made Keith Jackson himself had 167 yards of offense running and throwing in off that one series right there. Then OSU had the whole ball game because our defense stuffed them. Yeah, yeah that, that was incredible. I think the contrast of the, you know, the 83 game, you're talking about your building, your building, and that was a great performance against Nebraska. just didn't win that day. And then the 85 game was pretty much right. dominance yeah, from Nebraska. Dominant. So there was a long, you guys made a lot of moves on Nebraska that year. Uh, let's let's go to the Orange Bowl that year. Tell me the story oh. about it. We, talk, we oh. talked a little bit earlier oh. about some elevator yeah. stories. What happened? You know, it, you know, to set this story up, you got to realize. 84 year. 84 year, yeah, you're going to tell you. 84 year, we lose to Washington in the Orange Bowl. Opportunity, I think, to win the national championship, split yeah, it, maybe we're 9-1-1. Yeah. 
Nine one and one. BYU is thirteen and zero, but they played in the WAC. They, they beat the six and six Michigan team. They, they named a sewage plant after Coach you know. in, in Utah. <laughs> <laughs> I was voting us for the national championship. And so, and we'd have won that game. You know, we did, but we went out there and had a little bit too much fun. We enjoyed it. You know, it hadn't been there in a little while, so first year back, and we had a great time. We had some players from Miami, maybe in the wrong players to have, but we had a good time. And so the next year we go back. We spend two weeks in Miami. You know, we, we go down there, get acclimated to the weather. The second week in, Coach Switzer comes up and get this. He's the nicest guy. He's rah-rah. All of a sudden, he turns into this mean coach. Dang it, I'm sending anybody home who breaks curfew. We're here to win a championship. If you break curfew, you're going home. I don't care if it's coaches. I don't care if it's players. I don't care who it is. I don't care if it's equipment guys. You break curfew, you go home. Now, what happens, Coach? That's right. Well... The night before the ball game, Bobby Bell and I broke curfew. <laughs> and, and, and I think I'm the head coach. I ought to be able to break curfew. But, I, you know, as a team player, you're supposed to be in, you know, it's just like everybody else. So I uh, tell Bobby, I said, I know where the elevator is, utility elevator in the kitchen. We can take the elevator up to our floor. And this is one that players don't use. So I go to the player elevator. I mean, the, the elevator in the kitchen, you tell the elevator, and, and Bobby Bell and I hit this button, the door opens, and there stands Keith Jackson and, and Duncan Parham, my two <laughs> tight ends. Duncan's about 6'6", 245, right. plays behind Keith. There's Keith, both Bobby Bell and I are standing there looking up at these two guys. Not a word said. We get on the elevator. No sight, we're dead silence. I turn my back to both of them. I hit my button on the floor. Bobby hits his, and we go on up. Floor after floor after floor after floor, and slow elevator, you tell them, you know how slow they are. <laughs> so it's about an eternity getting up to my floor. Well, the door opens, my floor is up below the players. So they're above me. So I get off the elevator and I reach back and hold the door open. I turn back and look at Donnan. And Duncan and Kimi. Yeah. Keith. <laughs> I said, you didn't see me. I didn't see you. <laughs> <laughs> I turned to let it go. go. What, was he, it, what, was it, what was it? Uh, next, uh, what was it like when you saw them? Oh, uh, you uh, if you ever try to see two big guys morph into an elevator where the coach couldn't see them, <laughs> you know we got like we like we could hide in plain sight. We had a superpower. He does not see us, right? And so he he didn't say anything. He turned around and pushed his button. And he looked forward and everything. And, you know, we're both back there just panicking and everything. And then he, when he said, you didn't see me and I didn't see you, I said, oh, God. Because we thought we were going home. You know, well, we, uh, thought, we thought I'm we were going home. I'm not that damn dumb. <laughs> uh, but but uh, first pass we threw to him, he went, uh, what, 70 yards? 71 yards. Yard. 71 yards. Yard. Uh, home run ball. That, home that, run. that sealed that game. And, you know, when I think about your iconic plays, there may not be a person that is – you know, labeled with more iconic plays at Oklahoma than you. That was certainly one to seal a national championship game that was a hard-fought defensive battle, two really good teams. Well, you know, people always ask me, what is your biggest play uh, in your life? They go, in your life. And I've played a lot of football. I, and I go back from Little League all the way up. And I point out that play because it was for a big reason. I mean, you're talking about national championship. I didn't make a Super Bowl. I didn't make a touchdown in the Super Bowl. Uh, I could have, but they decided to follow me and not tackle Brett Favre, and he ran into the end zone. I was like, go get him, so I didn't catch one, you know, but, but I didn't. And so this was big. I mean, the game was on the line. Penn State had some really physical football play. They were a really good team, and it was back and forth, and uh, uh, they called that play, and I went down the middle of the field and caught that pass and went into the end zone, and then we kind of took the game over. Defense. To me, defense was good. And to me, that was a huge, huge, huge part. Of, I mean, huge play in my life because it really meant a lot. So when you say national championships, when people talk about it, that play will always be a part of a national championship run. When I, when I think, um, fast forward a little bit here and then we can backtrack, but when I think of Sooner Magic, I think the, of the 86 oh, game yeah. in Lincoln. I was yeah. going to bring that up next. And, and I wanted to move on from 85. We're talking about the 85. I wanted to go to 86. 86 years, was good. Here. Yeah, 86 Because good. We scored 10 points in the last two minutes of the ball game. We're behind Nebraska, and we scored 10 points to win the ball game. And it's all about Keith and his play. And uh, he catches the ball with Broderick Thomas trying to cover him. Right. I, I, that, that was, I, I wanted to notice that is that they had Broderick Thomas standing on the line 
covering you man to man. They had a with safety nine over seconds top. to go in the but, game. But they had a safety over the top. I was right. double exactly. team. Yeah. yeah, I was double team, and so I told Jamel. I said, Jamel, they're gonna double team me. I think they are. I'm gonna give a move, and 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 if it's a safety on the top, I'm gonna break out. Well, Jamel throws the ball like I'm going to the corner, and I look up and have a chance to tip it and catch it. But I was gonna break out, and, and so end up making a play. The the defensive back thinks he's got an interception to seal the game. But the tip makes him not hit it. Now, I got to tell you this. Switzer comes in the locker room. We're fired up because, you know, they got, they got the big key. We got the key to beating Oklahoma. This Nebraska. They're talking trash. We finally won this game. He comes in the locker room, and briefly we have a conversation. And he said, boy, that was Sooner Magic. That's the first time I ever heard it. That was Sooner Magic. And he says, he says, what were you thinking? I said, Coach, I was thinking I caught the ball and I was running down the sideline. And, and if, I, if, I, if I give him a move and bounce outside, he knocks me out. It stops the clock. We kick the field goal. He looked at me and said, ain't no dang football player that's smart. But sooner than that, he goes back. No. He goes back. He said, ain't no dang football player that's smart. People don't realize the situation, see, because not, if we're down the last, we're under a minute. Then uh, we're having to go 50, 40 yards to score. Yeah. The first play uh, of the yeah, drive, you ran, ran Lydell Carr yeah, for about 15 it, yards. Got, right yeah. then, then he makes the play, pass play down the boundary. Then he's has the wherewithal to not if he, any tight end caught the ball caught, caught about across the middle trying to score they're going to tackle him the game the, the, clock, the clock's going to run out but Keith steps out of bounds goes as far as he can and gets it in field goal position and Lasher comes in kicks it with six seconds left now I got to tell you this, this is, so this is great years later there's a guy by the name of Hunter Henry who plays for the University of Arkansas mm -hmm. great tight end and stuff and actually plays for, um, for the LA Chargers now uh, really good guy, and, and and so I called coach up. I said, "Did you see the Arkansas Ole Miss game?" He says, "No, and I know they won, but tell me about it." I said, "Well, they got this tight end, Nate Hummer Henry. He he caught the ball. It was in overtime. He knew he didn't have the yard to gain for fourth down. He just throws the ball back. He just tosses it up in there, really thinking like I can't get tackled with it. Remember the game? Right. Yeah. And the ball hits the ground. The running back picks it up, goes ahead and get a first down." Arkansas scores, and then Arkansas wins the game. He goes, yeah, yeah, what's it got to do with anything? I said, not only, right, are football players that smart, but the tight ends are the smartest football players on the team. <laughs> that was a smart play. Yeah. He, he convinced me. That, in that game, Keith caught the touchdown pass to tie or to bring him within one. You decided to kick the extra point instead of go for two. What was your thought process there? Well, uh, uh, just reset that. I don't remember that play. Don't so what know. happened was you flexed me out wide, did a fade route, caught a touchdown, and then we could go for two and tie it. Go for two and, and win. And, 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 and win, win, either win, win or win lose. Then. It was win right there, right, right. Win right there right. at that point. Right. And so you this, guys, we just kicked the field goal. Wait a minute. After we scored the field goal, we no, won the, the game. Are you talking about the no, 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 no. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I scored a touchdown before that. You remember the last ten points? Two I minutes, scored. With two minutes to go. Oh, yeah, right. You're down seventeen ten. He scores the touchdown. Right. Uh, and then you decide I, I, to kick the extra point. You guys were undefeated in the Big oh, A. Yeah, yeah, right. Nebraska had well, one Nebraska, loss to Colorado. Well, yeah, it's, uh, it, it puts us a tie for the championship. You know, right. One, one tie for the championship, that gave it to us. If right. it hadn't of, I would have gone for it. But that gave us a tie, so we kicked the kick because it since it's a tie, a tie. Yeah. Well, this is back before you played overtime right. games. And then, of course, we get it back, and we were able well, to make, make, some keep, plays. make the play and kick the yeah. field goal. One of the, one of the stunning things about that compared to today's football, when you look at it and you see how many touchdown passes quarterbacks are throwing, is that that day, at that time in the game, when Jamel threw that touchdown pass, you had three touchdown passes on the season and yeah. six interceptions. I mean, but he was clearly <laughs> an effective quarterback, but that statistic right. line was, just shows that, uh, you know, how dominant a, a run-oriented team that you were that season. But that game was something else. That was it one was, of the be was, better comebacks Nebraska, I think, in Oklahoma history. Nebraska was um, uh, Nebraska was great football. And when you looked across there, I mean, we played some great teams. We played Texas, you Oklahoma State, where, you know, Penn State or Miami. When you look across there, you had so much respect for those other players. And when you look across and you see, you know, Neil Smith and Broderick Thomas, and you start seeing oh, you some pretty good football players on that team, it's not going to be easy. It's going to come down to who can make the plays at the end of the game at the right time. And, and that game was one of them. I mean, you know, you just had to keep making plays. They got a little confident. They thought they could actually beat us. Bosworth, the one good thing he's known for is the fact he said, we're not going to the to the – What's the other bowl down there? In, in uh, not the Orange Bowl. What's the other one? Citrus Bowl. Citrus. We're not going to the Citrus Bowl. We're winning this game. So you know, we you know. we go to you know 
it, he has it, we have that great run, 84, 85, 86, 87. We win the Big 8 Conference Championship every year. And Keith's part of that, won a national championship. Uh, the 85 national championship team had six members of the Hall of Fame in it. We yeah, had six yeah. members of the Hall of Fame in it. Keith goes on to pro football. He's a first-round pick uh, and the uh, first tight end picked in the draft. He goes to pro football, plays nine years in the league. We're playing him for the Super Bowl. His, uh, next to his last year, he's in the league. And my son walks in, Doug says, we're playing uh, in uh, the championship game in Dallas, NFC championship game in Dallas. And my yeah. son comes to my house and he says, Daddy, I talked to Keith this morning. He's in Green Bay, and they would talk all the time. And he says, Keith said he had a dream last night, and he said he caught three touchdown passes and beat Dallas in the Super Bowl. I said, damn, Doug, why don't you come in here and tell me? <laughs> we to get ready to go NFC to the championship game. Yeah. Yeah. And this is to go to the Super Bowl. Yeah, to win and, to the Super Bowl. Uh, so what happens is that we're going into the fourth quarter. Keith has already caught two passes for two touchdowns, <laughs> and they hit him across the middle. And he, I swear he's going to break tackle, score, going to make his third touchdown, go ahead and beat us. Some way they got him down to about the five-yard yeah, line. Yeah, yeah. Hey, and we stop him and we hold him. Win. And then Emmett, we take a drive. And yep. Emmett take, we take it about 70, 80 yards for touchdown. And uh, I always said if I didn't ball. have that extra steak for breakfast, <laughs> I, I would have scored that touchdown. That, that extra steak at breakfast got me caught from behind. What was that like going against Coach? In the NFL. Oh, you know, it's just. Oh, it, tell about Gladys. What you oh, put yeah, on so, me. <laughs> what this on me. <laughs> if you don't think you still, still take care of them for life, we're getting life. ready to play this championship game. Hey, NFC what championship, happens, same game. Hey, Keith calls me, you know, and he says, Coach, I need some help. See, in the NFL, the home team controls all the tickets. The only tickets that Green Bay gets is just a few and enough for the team sideline passes or traders and all that. They, they don't get many tickets. And, and, and the coaches, I mean, the players don't get a few for the family. I said, well, how many tickets do you need for Gladys? And she said, well, she needs some tickets. And, and so oh, how many? He says, 34. <laughs> <laughs> it's the NFC Championship game. Hey. It's like it's so loud. I said, Keith, 34. <laughs> Yes, she's got a bus. She's taking, bringing all of the church down here for the game. I told you not to take your shoes off in my house. It's going to cost you. I'm telling you. I got 34 tickets Dead. for sure I did. got 34 tickets for Gladys. <laughs> drove from Little Rock, Arkansas to see them beat me in Dallas to go to the Super Bowl. <laughs> but she didn't get to see Boy, that. She didn't get she to see got it. 34 it. tickets. She, she sure got did. to see her son play in that game. And then I have a game against me. The next year... They did go to they the, Super the Super Bowl, Bowl right. and win the Super Bowl. Then he, Keith hung it up and went back to Little Rock to run his foundation. He's been running for years. Yep. And I want you to talk a little bit about Park. Yeah, so um, Ron Wolf, who the general manager for Oklahoma guy, mm -hmm. Oklahoma guy, Ron Wolf, Hall of Famer, college football, I mean, Pro Football Hall of Fame, said, "Told you, Jackson, if you can't, if you come here, because I was trying to get to Dallas to play with Coach." He said, "I told you, if you came to Green Bay, well, Coach was using me to get Jay Novacek to take a less of a salary. He used me. He did. He did. I know <laughs> That's he did. Jerry. I wasn't that was making Jerry, it. wasn't you? Okay, wasn't Jerry. Making. Still a homeboy, right. Arkansas guy. Anyway, and so he said, "I told you I was going to get you a Super Bowl ring if you come here, I, and I didn't. I didn't let you down." I said, "If I'd been with Switzer, I'd have had a year earlier." <laughs> but, but, um, yeah. What's, what happens is you, you. I think that. People think football is life. Football is fun. We have a great time playing football. As players, we just love it. Um, there's no question about it. You, you have great coaches and great players around you. It builds a, a work ethic and all that stuff, but it's not your purpose because you're not physically able to do it your whole life, and you're always searching for a purpose. And at that time in my life, I was saying, what is my purpose? Really good at football. You know, I go play the game. I was really great at it. But I want to know what my purpose is in life. And I kept saying, God, what am I here for? And he gave me this vision called PARC, which stands for Positive, Positive Atmosphere Reaches Kids. I moved back home to Little Rock and started this program. We're attacking deficiencies, raising GPAs, and take these kids who were making around a 1.5 GPA and actually raising their GPAs from the 8th grade until the 12th grade to they're making three fives. They start off academic, academically deficient.
efficient and they end up making 30s on ACT. So our progress is a process over the years. And we got all these kids now who have gone off to college, have graduated from college, who have these great jobs. And that's basically what I do every day in Little Rock, Arkansas. And every college in the state of Arkansas gives them a scholarship yep. every year. Free of charge. Our kids free. graduate with no debt. And they go to oh. a great oh. program. He's got lawyers, and right. doctors. He's got people that come back and hundreds that have already graduated from this program that never had a chance in life, wouldn't have had, unless he had given up and had this vision come back to Little Rock. And a small town, people, Little Rock's not big as Oklahoma, but no. Oklahoma City's three times, four times larger than Little Rock. Little Rock's about 150, 60,000. Yep. Then you get North oh, Little Rock yeah. across about 100, so it's about 250 in the metro area. But he comes back, starts this program, he gets Walmart behind him, gets uh, Tyson's, yeah. gets a lot of people behind him, the Stevens boys. And I'm gonna tell you, he has got the greatest facilities over there for kids. They come off a bus, they get off at uh, in the school yeah, at 3.30. There go two hours of academics with the top of all the computers. I mean, they got the best of everything. And then they get a football, a basketball, they Rugged go in play. the weight room. Yeah. They got teaching girls cosmetics, uh, how to do the hair and all that. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful thing. And the mamas, most of them single parent mamas have got their kids there. They don't have to come pick them up to 10, to 10 o'clock at night. It's their babysitting, basically, too. Right, right, and right. keeping the kids off Last the street. Year. And yeah. we've got police protection there. No one comes in and out. We've got police on duty all the time at park. And uh, it's just been a great atmosphere. He went back, no athletes. There are no athletes. It had nothing to do with athletes. It happened to do with kids that wanted to get ahead in life but hadn't had a chance. And what they needed to do is sign a contract with him. If you don't get do drugs, you don't get pregnant, then we'll have an opportunity to, go to, to get a college yeah, and get an education and separate yourself and make do something for you and your family the rest of your life. So, Coach, <clears throat> Mark, Coach, I don't think he has. Think I have a life because from time to time he'll call me and ask me what am I doing. <laughs> but, but 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 he creates these great trips that I get to go on. I right. get to be a part of and everything. And uh, you, you probably heard this. This is this is a sensitive one. It's, okay. It's more intimate than you probably want to hear. But <laughs> Coach told me I could tell any story I want. So here it goes. I get a phone call at my house saying, Big Bo, what are you doing? I go, Coach. Uh, I said I'm sitting up here uh, in Little Rock at my office. You want to go see your boy play in the NFC Championship game? I go, yeah, it'd be nice. I said, when you down in New Orleans? Said, yeah, your boy Brett Favre going to be playing against New Orleans. This is going to be a big game, so you, you, you might want to go. And I said, well, Coach, you know it's Friday, and tomorrow Saturday game's on Sunday. I mean, I've got a last-second plan. So he said, well, get one of them rich white boys to fly you on the plane down there. I didn't say that. It'd be, it'd be racist if I said it, but I didn't say it. So... <laughs> So this is a true story. So he said, wait a minute. He said, now when you fly down now, he said, he said, don't worry about it. You know, yeah, we're gonna stay at the what were you saying? Uh, Rich Carlton. Uh, Rich Carlton's the yeah. old Mason Blanche uh, department store on Canal Street. They made it to Rich Carlton, so we're gonna stay there. Adrian Peterson's playing for Green Bay now. All right. And uh, Brett Favre, Minnesota, 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 both Minnesota of them. Right. Brett Favre yeah. and both of them yeah, Minnesota, Minnesota now. Yeah. And playing New Orleans, Brett Favre, I mean Drew Brees and all and uh, this big championship game for the Super Bowl. It's tough to get a hotel room. Yeah, basically. It, it, so it, I got, it is, I got but, tickets and all that. Yeah. And, and uh, Keith, we show up at that restaurant down there. Right. We made that restaurant. Right. Have the best time. We have a great meal. All his buddies. GW from Little Rock. fans. Okay, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah great place in the quarter in the Via Caray. And we're down there and, and uh, we're all having a great time. A lot of good wine, good food. And everybody goes in about 12 o'clock. Keith and I love blues. We love music. Music. We went to every great music bar down yep. there. Two o'clock in the morning, we get back to the hotel, and I told Keith, don't get a room. You're going to stay with me. I got us a room. I got us a room with two double beds. We get back to the hotel, and uh, we go to the room, and we walk in the room, and uh, it's king size bed. <laughs> so so I, pick, I said, don't worry about it, Keith. We both look at the bed. I said, I called. They made a mistake. I go over and pick up the phone. I called the front desk, and I said, uh, it's Coach Switzer. I said, I had ordered a room with two double beds. And, uh, and she said, well, that's all we got, Coach. And I said, you don't know other rooms? She said, no, we're sold out. He says, that's all the room we got, you've got. I said, well, can you send up a rollaway? All the rollaways are used. No. They're all, all gone. gone. All gone. All I looked at Keith. I looked at Keith and I said, which side of the bed do you want? <laughs> and Keith looked at me. He said, Coach, it ain't going to matter which side you get on. You're going to be holding on to the side of the bed. <laughs> so we, we get in bed. 
that King's I was about bed, 40 pounds heavier at that time. Yeah, I, I was about bed, 40 pounds heavier. Yeah, yeah. So we get in that bed, and Rich Carlton, and I'm lying there I'm about this much, and I'm like, <laughs> Wait a minute, you had more room than that. <laughs> it was like, what's that? You had about the plane trains and automobiles. automobiles. Those are not pillows. Those are not pillows. <laughs> so, so what happens? So what happens is that uh, I get that morning about seven o'clock. I wake up and I'm on my back and I look up at the ceiling. I was like, kind of smiling and just thinking about this what this picture looks like. <laughs> <laughs> and Keith, all of a sudden I hear this voice, what you smiling about, Coach? <laughs> I said, Keith, I'm thinking about what if someone would open the door and come, <laughs> come in this room and see us both in bed now, what, what would they think? And of course I added this. Yeah, you embellish a little bit on this part. Everything's been true. Everything's so, true to this part. what I said, what I like to add to it, about that time the door opened, and this maid walks in, sees us, and she screams and runs back out in the hall. And I jump up, I chase her down the hall, and he said, said, "What are you doing, Coach?" I said, "I'm getting her to come back and take a picture." <laughs> <laughs> no one's gonna believe this. Oh yeah. my goodness! So I got up. <laughs> he says, "He says I'm gonna stay in bed a while." I get dressed. I walk downstairs. It's Harold Ham. Yep, 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 All yep, our yep, buddies, all here we were with John Bear, all yep, our buddies yep, and friends, and they're yep. having breakfast. And I walk in there. And y'all not gonna believe what I'm fixing. No, take. wait a minute now. <laughs> I told you we were sworn to secrecy. Oh yeah, we were sworn to secrecy. You said you're gonna take it to the grave. Okay. Okay, <laughs> then you go downstairs. I go downstairs. You're not gonna believe what happened to us last night. <laughs> and they said, no, that didn't happen. I said, well, get your ass up and go upstairs and I'll show you right now. We walk upstairs, we all go open the door and Keith still laid out in the bed. He wanted to sleep a little longer. And now he's covering the whole bed. <laughs> Arms off both sides of the bed. So what happens is that, oh, of course, everybody, they'll take pictures of him in bed. He says, Coach, why don't you get back in it? We'll take a picture of him. <laughs> but that happened, and uh, uh, I told now we've sworn to secrecy. Don't go back yeah, to Arkansas. Yeah, no, no, we were sworn to secrecy before. We were sworn to secrecy before. Well, the great part of that was, it's a true story, he's sitting there, and, uh, and, 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 and John Barry says, uh, chairman of the Quapaw Chairman of the Quapaw, Quapaw, he comes in the Arkansas room. Arkansas graduate. And, and he says, uh, Coach, now I know how you sign all your great players. <laughs> <laughs> Sleep with them. So, no, so I always ask Coach sometime, I say, Coach, you might as well be honest. I'm your favorite player. I had done that for years. And he go, and, and it irritates him because he loves all his old players. He just loves his players. Everybody knows it. He says, he's so close to everyone. I mean, I go, you can just go and tell the truth. It's just me and you. Just say it out loud, coach. You love me more than you love all the other players. And he go, why do you always say that? You always try to make me pick. So now I know that I can say this for sure, I hope, that we're the only one that slept together out of all this way. <laughs> we got another way. We're not talking anymore. We're not talking anymore. Oh, exit. Through. We're through. Show's no, over. it's too late now. You just snitched on me. So he told everybody the story downstairs. It just ironically happens that I'm speaking in his hometown the next week after this event. I've got a speaking engagement, I'm there. But it's a church committee, right? I'm speaking at a church, so I'm going, how can I get this story in? <laughs> and so I tell the story. Before I can finish the story, they're already texting and calling him saying, oh, you slept with Keith Jackson. <laughs> That secret didn't last long. It didn't last weeks. long. It didn't last long. Oh, it didn't great. last long. That is great. That's great. Um, uh, I think we should end on that. That's awesome. That's good. <laughs> no more. You no guys more stories. Go, you got to go over under. The over, oh, no, somebody's got to be over the we're, covers we're, and under the, 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 the exactly covers. Exactly right. That was great.